What's going on? And welcome to Beastly Thoughts, episode 151. Uh, we got up over the 150 hump. I'm a little surprised, guys. Hey, this, is a, this is a big big thing. 150. That's usually where the dying. podcast falls apart. I never really thought we'd get past 100. <laughs> where it all goes downhill. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, number 10 I thought was pretty rocky. <laughs> number I mean, 10, that's way back. That wow. To be honest... With all the news we've had this week, I'm surprised any of us are still on this planet at the moment. So it's, you <laughs> yeah, know, it's right. good times. I'm just, just happy we're here. <laughs> Not yeah, just enjoying us, every so. minute, every minute. <laughs> just working one week to next. If you make 152, it's a victory. So we're there. Uh, Beastly couldn't be with us tonight. He may join us later, but it's doubtful. Uh, he, he had a uh, family dinner for Easter, the Easter holiday. So he won't be joining us tonight. But we do have Robbie, we do have Gary, so we are good to go. We got a lot to talk about. I know Gary already shared some of his notes on all the games he wants to talk about. I got a lot of games I got to talk about too. Uh, one of them, of course, is Destiny, but I got some other stuff too. But Robbie, what have you been playing this week? Uh, I should probably first say that our starting soon screen is still up. I don't see the actual stream. So that's awkward. You're probably <laughs> delayed then. The stream delay. Is it all good? I believe so. Let me Maybe. refresh real quick. No, I still see it. It still says starting soon. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's a stream. You want, me to, you want me to just go along with it then? All right. We're here. Yeah, oh, we there are. we go. Now I see it. Yeah, Robbie. So we've been talking for 10 minutes about something that happened a minute ago. Why don't you tell <laughs> us what you've been doing for the week? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this week, I have been playing a lot of a game that came out, I think, five years ago now. This is five one years. of my favorite Call of Duty games. Uh, oh. It became backwards compatible. Black Ops 2, man, is finally on the Xbox One. And let me say that game is a freaking blast. Old school, boots on the ground Call of Duty. I personally love it. Uh, I mean, it pretty much plays exactly like I remember it. And it's so, so much fun. I am having a blast with it. The only thing that sucks is that... Because it's an emulation, right? Because it's not like a native Xbox yeah. One game. The netcode is a little wonky, but oh my god, the game the is just netcode so netcode on that so game fun. was always a little wonky. <laughs> That's the thing, and now it's like, ooh, it's really? kind of rough. Let me ask you. Yeah. So you're you're playing an emulated version of Black Ops 2. I haven't played this, so I'm, I'm asking you this, these questions because I don't know. You're playing an emulated version of the 360 game on your mm -hmm. Xbox One, but you're playing against potentially other players who are still on the Xbox 360, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So it's not like you're in this cordoned off Xbox One only lobby. No, I have to imagine okay. most people by now are probably playing on Xbox One, though. I'd have to think so. How does it point, control? Right? Like, because I mean, I remember playing that game, you know, and it was a it was a good feeling game. It's one of my favorite Call of Duties of all time. How do you? How does it feel going back? I mean, I will say it feels exactly the same. The control is flawless. I've been using the Elite controller because, you know, you got to have those paddles. you got to have those thumbsticks. It controls really great. It's just as I, you remember it. And like I said, the only thing that sucks is, you know, you'll get those connection interrupted. It's like 2012 all over again. You get connection issues, have a little bit of hit detection issues where it's like, you know, the bullets don't really land that well or it's delayed, which is a bummer. But, I mean, the game is just so fun. It's I can forgive it in a way. Because it is an old game, and you know it's being emulated, so I'm mm -hmm. still having fun with it. When it, when it came out, it was the first time I think that a lot of people realized what was going on with the with the connection, where people mobility was an advantage because of the net code, right? It's like the the person who's coming around the corner is going to see the person who's standing on the other side of that corner before the person right. who's standing there is going to see that person come around the corner. I think it's one of the first games we really realized what was going on there with like host compensation and all of that stuff. Yeah, um, and it, it got a lot of I don't know press. I don't know if press is the right word. It got a lot of flack because of that. Um, but it was a fun game. It was a lot of fun. Oh, it's so much fun. I love going back into it. It's been a blast. That was one of the last single player cods I played. Is that the one that starts off with the that sort of African um, general charging in tanks over? Yeah, there? yeah. That was the very first level. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I didn't didn't play the uh, the emulation, but yeah, that was a, a fantastic single player campaign as well. If I remember, I personally loved it. Yeah, one of my favorites. I didn't play the single player campaign until like October. Really? <laughs> of like the yeah, following. Yeah. I remember year. you saying that, Briar. That was that yeah. was the last Call of Duty that was specifically designed for the 360 and the PS3, right? Was that that was the last last gen one? Yeah, that was the last. The Ghost came out on last gen as well. 
but it was, it was a joint development. It was yeah, sort of current and last gen. Right. Okay. So how does that feel then, Robbie? Playing something that was a last gen game as opposed to like you know the, a game like Ghosts or Advanced Warfare that had both ports. Mm, I mean, there's one other thing too that's nice about this is the frame rate is actually better on Xbox One as well. It's a more consistent 60 frames per second, which obviously is super important. That's what Call of Duty's built on is that smooth gameplay, and you certainly feel it. So you do, it doesn't really feel like a last-gen game to me. I mean, I'm just thinking, like, while I'm playing it, it's just so fun. That's what I'm thinking. It's just I really enjoy this, and I can't wait to have, like, an old-school feeling Call of Duty this year with World War II. I just hope they knock it out of the park with that. So this was uh, an improvement on Modern Warfare Remastered, then? Yeah, I would say so. I didn't really get into... Modern for remaster. I don't know why it just didn't really grab me, but this is grabbing me a lot more. Nice. What else have you been playing? Um, not too much. I've been playing some stuff in the uh, Xbox Spring Sale that's been going on this week. Been playing some Dead Island and Dead Island Riptide. Those got remastered. Got them both for like sixteen bucks, which is crazy to me. You know, they're really fun. I really like those games back in the each day. Or sixteen for the pair. No, for, for both. That ain't bad. Yeah, so eight bucks a game, really good. Uh, been playing a bit of State of Decay. Just started that game, also very fun. That was like ten dollars. So yeah, just been playing a lot of different stuff, and it's been a lot of fun. Nice, Gary. What have you been up to? Thanks. So for myself, I've played a lot of games. I'm only going to cover two of them today. One being a PS4 game, uh, Persona Five, or well, PS4 and PS3. Actually, I didn't realize it was released on the PS3, but New game still coming out on the three, which I thought was that came was out on the PS3. No shit, I didn't know that. It is. It's actually twice as much money on the PS3 because it's such a limited print run. Uh, really? So if you can, <laughs> if you can find it on the PS3, keep it wrapped up because that's going to be a, a relic. But yeah, Persona Five, um, and for the PlayStation VR was Adventure Time inside Magic Man's head. So I'm going to start off with Persona Five and then move on to the the VR game. So Persona Five for uh, people who don't know is a mature take on a JRPG or Japanese role-playing game set in a high school where you go to school, conduct the general day-to-day tasks of a high school student, uh, but then of an evening or when you travel into the shadow realm, you free the corrupted dark hearts of adults that have fallen, I guess, fallen victim to their own pride and uh, self-corruption. So really deep, really psychological tale um, and really in keeping with the Persona franchise. So have any of you guys, Briar or Robbie, played any of the Persona games in the past? No. Never played them. Okay, so if you've ever played any of the Final Fantasy games, um, it'd probably give you an idea. Final Fantasy pre-13, when it was still turn-based um, and ability-based, where you could summon spells or go into melee combat. I think we should very, restart very... the stream just to put in quick. It's having major issues. Robbie, there's nothing I can do about it. So uh, I am recording the show separately. Don't worry about the stream health. Worry about putting on a good show. Okay. Go ahead, Gary. Sorry. No worries at all, guys. So, yeah, for the Persona uh, fans or for fans of the JRPG, people that want to get into that area, Persona has, has, or Shin Megami Tensei as a series has been an outstanding and stellar series. Every one of the Persona games right the way back from the PlayStation Portable original through the PS3, uh, oh, sorry, PS2 PS Vita games have all been spectacular. This is the first time we've seen one on the PS4, so it takes advantage of the hardware there to deliver something that looks stunning. It it jumps back and forward between anime, uh, fully drawn uh, inked anime uh, cutscenes, and then in-game story and narrative. You've got somewhere in the region of about 120 hours of story in there, and it really does feel like you're binge-watching a high-quality anime series on Crunchyroll as opposed to playing a game. Um, which is a good thing in in many ways. So I don't know if anyone, uh, again, is an anime fan here, but if you guys are into that, no. (laughs) This is where we need Beastly. I know Beastly's got the uh, the Otaku. Yeah, you need Beastly for this one. I know he'd be right there with you, Gary, but, man, I I could not care less. (laughs) (laughs) Not about anime. Not not about – Persona 5 actually looks really good. From the video I've seen of it, it it looks beautiful. I love the music I've heard as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, everything about it looks very interesting. The only thing that's keeping me from playing it is the fact that I can't stream it. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. streaming element, which we, we touched on last week, is a bit of a 
a bit of a spanner in the works for people like yourselves who are you know rely upon content creation to to share your experiences with with people and the fact that you're not able to do that is is a bit of a stifling um issue there and is stopping this game maybe getting the audience it deserves what i will say in defense of atlas the creators and why i think they're stopping persona being spread in that way is that this game is very much something that's personal to you and the stories resonate with you because you're experiencing them for the first time and you're wondering when these kids and when these high schoolers are going to overcome the troubles that they're facing and if you've seen that already in a stream it, it it's not a, a game that i would pick up and play again immediately after knowing what's going to happen on the next part of the chapter of the story so it doesn't quite have the replay that some other games have so from from my perspective i could see why they've done that there um mm -hmm. that being said i think it's very smart and it's it's very current in that the the kids are effectively delving into adults minds to to cure the um the corruption they face and or they see uh, in, a, in a corrupt society and it, it very much mirrors or as an allegory to the world that we live in where young people are becoming more politically active or or in, you know protesting more there's more activism in in the world uh, and this is a story about high schoolers waking up to the corruption in society and becoming you know secret activists to break it down so yeah it, it feels really uh, current and, and really on topic and uh, it you know it, it it feels a lot as well. The other thing that I felt when I was playing it that I felt like I was playing an, an Eastern Bioware game, very much the the same vibe that I got from Mass Effect Andromeda in that the story really mattered and carried it forward. So if you're not into the JRPGs, this might be a, a good horizontal move from someone that's that's played games like Bio, uh, like um, Bioware games. Yeah. Nice. So. Aside from that, in the VR front, I played a game called um, Adventure Time Magic Man's Head Game. So this is for the Oculus and the Vive. Is this any it's relation not... to the cartoon Adventure Time on Comedy Central? Or not Comedy it Central? It is. And... Cartoon Network. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So cool. I picked it up because myself and my fiance are massive Adventure Time fans. She's got all the series on Blu-ray, loves the humor. Um, and it was also a lead up to the Rick and Morty virtual reality game that's coming out <laughs> so if you're fans of of that sort of space then then this should be right up your street it was five dollars mm -hmm. so i didn't expect much uh it's a 3d action platformer so if you've played lucky's tale on the oculus very yeah. similar to that or on the playstation vr if you played robot rescue plays akin to that so you're controlling the main character finn the human uh, with jake the dog and you're platforming through magic man's mind maze what i will say about it is it felt um unpolished and incomplete and a little bit of a cash in on the adventure time brand mm -hmm. um it not being long or the length of it is not a problem uh, and that's what i've been told many times by many ladies and i i cling to that that uh, <laughs> <laughs> length, length is <laughs> it's not it's not the problem here no what the issue with it is, is part of it the the humor um isn't there the, the game being 30 minutes long is absolutely fine. It felt like a, I was going to treat it like an episode of Adventure Time. Uh, and if it was chock-a-block with Adventure Time humour and gags and feel, you know, dripping with that, that essence, I, I would have been satisfied with it. To me, it felt like you were playing bland environments that weren't the landmarks you knew from the cartoon and the, the series. Um, and the comic, the comedy, whilst it used the real voice actors from the, from the series, it was so sparse and few and far between that you were kind of starved of it uh, mm -hmm. you're starved of the adventure time humor so to me ultimately even at five dollars i can't recommend it which is sad because i really wanted it to be a playable episode of adventure time to get me warmed up for the rick and morty game uh, but yeah unless yeah. you're a huge adventure time fan and, and you probably already bought it if you are um it's not worth the five dollars sadly that's sad that's so, sad for, for five dollars too you think you know like hey you know but five dollars that's rough. Yeah, it was. I, I watched her play it. Um, I didn't have any desire to then play through it myself. It was enough to watch her on screen playing it. So that, that just tells you what sort of replay value it has. But um, that was really the the two major things I wanted to talk about. A lot more um, little things I've played, like Hyperdimension Neptunia, which I was going to chat with Beastly about. But I'll part of that one till next week. And I've also, um, I'm about four years late on this one, but I bought a PlayStation Vita Slim uh, after watching my other half play it. Uh, and absolutely enjoy it. I think she's played World of Final Fantasy. She's put about 100 hours into World of Final Fantasy on the Vita. Um, and I've kind of finally got what that machine did. Um, so I bought one, 
I'm going to be putting in some hours into it next week and we can uh, catch up on why I'm four years late for the Vita then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The sad thing about it is there's just not Vita. a whole lot of software, but the nice thing is that as long as you got a good internet connection, you can play PS4 games, you know, in your house or even on, like on the go with a mobile connection if you got a good enough connection. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, uh, I look forward to, to digging into that. But, uh, Brian, I'm really keen to hear what you've been playing, especially if it's not Destiny as well. <laughs> well, surprised. I'll start off with <laughs> Destiny anyway. Destiny. I, I did start with Destiny. Um, I have been playing the uh, the Age of Triumph continues, and uh, this week's uh, raid was the Oryx fight, the uh, King's Fall raid. And, uh, man, I... After all the excitement of doing Crota again and doing Vault of Glass again, I realized that I just have no interest in doing the King's Fall raid like ever really? again. And part of that, you know, I've been thinking about it a lot. I actually meant to make a video about it. I just, I just ran out of time. Part of it is that I ran it so often because it was the only raid, the only current raid for a full year, right? So if you wanted to raid in year two. It was King Fall, King's Fall or Bust. But the other part of it that I think really it bores me very quickly is how rigid it is. Um, there's just so many moments in that raid where you're literally just standing there shooting at stuff. There's, you're not moving around. You're not, you're not dynamically trying to stay alive. You're literally, you know, once you've gotten used to the raid and once you have a, peop a few people in the raid who are pretty good at explaining what you need to do, you are very literally just standing still and firing straight ahead, right? And it yeah, happens yeah. It happens at the totems. It happens with the war priest. It happens with the sisters. And then it happens with with uh, Oryx himself. And it just kind of it feels so repetitive. And as it, we're in Vault of Glass, going back to it, we only had that raid as our like primary raid for like four months. I think it was four months, September to December. Yeah. <laughs> doing yeah. my math not very well and then uh, as soon as as soon as dark below came out you know vault of glass had gotten left behind and this is the first time it got brought back up so this is the first time it's been a current raid you know after that initial time but also going into that raid you feel very dynamic you feel like you know you've got you've got tasks to do you've got to kill oracles you got to kill the templar you got all this sort of stuff you got to do but at the same time, it always feels like you're just you're in a fight for survival. You're just trying to stay alive. You're you're bouncing in and out of cover. You know, there's always this sense of timing. Like I need to focus on the objective here, but I also need to like kill all these ads and just keep myself and my teammates alive for long enough to get through this fight. Whereas I just never feel like that in the Taken King. I did initially, like when the the whole raid was newer, but once you really kind of figure it out. Once you once you have a raid team that's pretty good at it, you really do find that you know you just kind of stand in one place and you and you're doing it. So I don't know. I'm I'm a little over the the uh, Oryx raid right now. I'm looking forward to Wrath the Machine next week. So with Kingsfall, um, and this is probably speaks more to me and my background with uh, MMO games at mm -hmm. heart and the amount of hours I put into them. I felt that Kingsfall resonated with me mostly as an MMO raider. The mechanics are very rigid as you say mm -hmm. it's there's tactics to beating a boss you have to stand here if you don't stand here and your team doesn't adhere to this rotation you will wipe there's there's no two ways about it this is mm -hmm. the mechanic this is what you have to do to execute so to me that made sense the other raids felt a bit more chaotic and a bit looser and that you had a bit more freedom to do them in your own way yeah. uh, and and uh, again were, were less um less resonating with me personally do you think that potentially the MMO first-person shooter hybrid that, that, that Destiny is works better when it maybe parks some of that MMO aspect in its raids and does adopt the more frantic shooter-style um, attitude towards raids. You, you got a totally different type of game, right? Whereas most MMOs are like these top-down kind of things. And, you know, Destiny is a shooter. So, like, to ask a shooter player to just stand still, I, I don't know. It feels like a tall order. I, it works mm. like initially, but then after repeated playthroughs, and again, like it's not fair because the Taken King was the primary raid for an entire year, so it, it just got played to death, right? Yeah. But I don't know. For me, to ask a shooter player to just like stand still all the time, yeah. you know, encounter after encounter after encounter, 
it just it feels so restricting and somewhat just boring, right? Yeah. I hear you. I mean, do you think it could be improved maybe if it if it did even dig deeper into the MMO side of things? So rather than just standing still, obviously there's there's um tends to be room rotation that needs to happen in the same way that, that totems has quite heavy use of rotation. I know you say this is standing still, but in totems, you really yeah. have to be aware of every 15 seconds where your positioning is. But what really differentiates MMO raids for me is things like damage optimization. Mm-hmm. So I really have to pick a loadout that works and creates the, lo- the, the highest level of damage output. And I know Datto and the guys will do extreme lengths of damage optimization videos of what the best loadouts are for in- encounters. But in all honesty, he's doing that from a, a more inf- information perspective. You can run most of the raids in Destiny unless you are severely underleveled with any loadout that you want right. and still deliver the, the amount of damage in that window. Do you think that there's merit to maybe taking the raids that way and saying, actually, you need to optimize, you need to have these stacking debuffs, you need to deliver in this way, you need to... Uh, for the sequel, maybe. I'm just... I, I do. I, I think there's part of that is... The, the initial classes that we had in Destiny uh, were a little restrictive in that way. It did improve with the Night Stalker and with the changes to the Sunsaker Warlock and with the uh, Sunbreaker Titan. Like, you know, the, these opportunities did present themselves more, I think, after year two. But you don't need to use them once you're a proper level. And I don't think damage is your main concern when you're not proper level in Destiny. It's really staying alive. That's although if you can kill something faster, then that helps your that does help your uh, chances of staying alive. Uh, but I would like to see more more thought into the customization of classes for a team loadout. Right? Is like more more what you're saying is DPS. You know, helps for the rest of your team. A support class for each of the you know. Uh, main classes I think would be a lot of fun uh, but yeah that'd be a lot of fun it'd be fun to yeah. see them explore that area more and I know that they've said in the past or um, I'm not sure if Bungie themselves have said or a spokesperson of Bungie have said that they didn't want class requirements for a raid so they didn't want a raid to say you must take a titan you must take a warlock um, so that anyone from LFG doesn't feel that there's a mandatory requirement to be someone but I think what I was getting at is for the sequel maybe they could still keep the rigidity of king's fall but make it more interesting in the sense that you need two players that are running shotgun because there might be enemies that come at you with you know, lots and lots of vulnerability spots but they're spread across their body and maybe there's some that are far away that you put snipers on to hit those things and then mm-hmm. just so that there's there's a requirement for people to actually have a strategy within and a you know team synergy yeah, I, I don't know I like but to me that king's fall would feel a lot more interesting if you had that so so that's what Vogue I feel like does though, right? Is yeah. like, yeah, because like a perfect loadout for me in Vogue is like I got a couple of guys with maybe uh, Dark Drinkers to take care of, you know, the the Praetorians that come out, you know, that they need to be killed right away at close range. Then you got a guy who's got a sniper rifle on each side of the map who's just worried about taking out the snipers that are constantly harassing you. You know, and you got a, you got another guy who's just worried about, you know, whatever his job is. Vogue to me has more of that, whereas at King's Fall really does it does really feel like you're just standing around the whole time, and you are focused on doing DPS. But because I've run it so to- so many times, I find myself just using random weapons just for fun, because yeah, you know, a scout rifle, sniper rifle, um, combo just got boring <laughs> after a while, you know. Oh, no, I hear completely. Yeah. You. I'm, not, I'm not saying that King's Fall is, is the utopia, but I, just, I feel it gets a lot of flack. And for me, it feels like a really well polished and put together raid um, and something that maybe execution of it isn't as fun as Bungie had, had hoped in their design. But I think design wise, it's it's a masterpiece for a shooter to create something that's that complex that can still be done by six strangers with mm-hmm. difficulty. But yeah, you know, it's an achievement. It is an achievement. It's a it's a great raid. It, again, it. I don't think I'd be so hard on it if it weren't for the fact that it was the raid for the entire year. I just got burnout on it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I also <clears> want to <throat> talk about some other games, though. I want to move on. Hollow Knight. Gary, didn't you talk about Hollow Knight a couple weeks ago? Um, I don't no? believe so. Okay. So Hollow Knight is available on Steam right now. I believe it's also coming to the Switch at a later date. It is a very cool-looking, um, side-scrolling, Metroidvania-type game. 
Uh, you play as kind of this like bug knight. And it kind of got like these little bug antenna horn things, like a beetleish kind of looking dude. Uh, but it's a it's a very very good looking and very fun version of a Metroidvania. You explore a world. You have to you know ex- uh, build your map up as you go. Uh, you have you have a nail for a sword, and it feels very responsive. It feels very good. Uh, it looks absolutely gorgeous. It's not like a it's not vibrant as far as like a lot of colors popping out, but it's very nice hand drawn art, and it's very yeah. atmospheric in a way that uh, really, you know, it just sells the world and it sells, you know, like this adventure. Uh, I do like this type of game, uh, but there's been a lot of them recently that have come out that just didn't really fill the niche for me. Um, And this one really does. It really does bring me back to the old days of playing, you know, Metroid specifically. Metroid or or even Castlevania or Castlevania, uh, one of the sequels. I really do enjoy it quite a bit. So this is the one that looks um, a little bit like a kind of a fairy tale Studio Ghibli sort of like forest spirits from Princess Mononoke, like the white tiki mask yeah. characters. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's almost monochromatic, almost right. There's there's a lot of blues, like dark blues and a lot of dark greens, um, but it just it looks fantastic and it's very responsive. It feels great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm really having fun with it. I've put in about five hours into it, so I couldn't really like review the game other than say that it's only fifteen dollars. And if you like this type of yeah. game, it's probably an easy pickup. So you said Metroidvania, because um, I do like side-scrolling games. I, I really enjoy them. Um, but for me, I, I played Odin Sphere, um, and that's probably about as hectic as as I like from a side scroll. As I'm, mm-hmm. I'm an old man, and my reaction time is is appallingly slow. Uh, I really enjoyed Child of Light which was another side-scrolling game. I don't know if you played Child of Light, but that was a fairy tale side-scroller where mm-hmm. you were... A, sort of, uh, it was it was all written in um, rhyming couplets so that the whole story was told to you as, as fairy tale evolved. And the combat was very slow. It tended to be that it was more the, the beauty of the art and the design and the story and how it unfolds. So would you say the combat is closer to a Metroid or closer to like a Child of Light I didn't play thing. Child of Light. Uh, it's fast combat. It felt. Have you ever played Guacamelee? Yes. It feels a little mm. bit like that, but not as complex, uh, not as finger bending. <laughs> you know, it's it's quick. Yeah. You have an attack button. You go in for the attack. You build your powers up. You get more. You get you get more powers, more attacks as you go. You get you know access to uh, new areas with by uncovering new powers. Like uh, you know, you get this kind of like beam attack where you shoot this like beam <laughs> you get you know you unlock new jumping abilities that kind of stuff it uh it, it's probably most similar to castlevania you, you don't okay. you don't actually shoot much you just kind of have this like sword swipe it's not it's not entirely difficult either it's not like one of those games like ori in the blind forest which was really exciting game to me uh that kind of fit into this mold but was so difficult that it became frustrating very quickly and this game, you know, you just kind of plug along and you make progress, and that's that's okay, too. Every game doesn't have to be impossible. That's great, because like uh, Salt and Sanctuary, which was like a 2D Dark Souls, very similar to that, very monochromatic. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get into that either. Again, games that have a high difficulty threshold, I know some people absolutely live for that. Yeah. For me, I play, I play my games on, like, the easy mode, the, the <laughs> lowest possible settings. I, I just like to be entertained, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. The fact that you've said that that's not uh, too difficult is definitely worth a worth a look. Would you say this is a must buy now on Steam, or is this one that you think would work well to wait for the Switch? Uh, I mean, I really like playing it on Steam. Uh, I also I've been playing it downstairs on my Steam, whatever it is, the Steam Box. Steam uh, Box. Just, yeah, and uh, you know, at this point, I'm just not so sure Switch is going to be able to. It's a 2D platformer. I would imagine the Switch is going to run it fine. Uh, I'm running it at 4K at 60 frames per second. It looks really nice. All right, we, all know, we all know how Damn. big your e- e- penis is here. You know, you don't have to, don't have to whip it out. Yeah, don't swing camera. that thing around, Briar. I mean, oh I'm God. sure it'll, I'm sure it'll be fine on the Switch. I just, you know, if it if it's running at 30 yeah. frames per second, you have access to a PC that can run it at 60. Then, yeah, you know, probably not. Uh, next up, I wanted to talk about Overwatch Uprising. You guys have a chance to play the new PVE mode of Overwatch. Is that no. King's Row, the, the oh, map? Yeah, yeah. 
I haven't. I should bring my fiance down to talk about this segment because she's just never played Overwatch before. Just got uh-huh. into this week, and she's an absolute convert. She's been raving about it. So I'd love to hear your. Uh, yeah, your it's take. really fun, man. It's like this. Uh, it's kind of like a objective mode, cooperative mode of Overwatch, where you fight PVE enemies instead of you know a PVP battle. Um, basically, you've got to go to these objectives and like stand in a spot just like you would in PVP. But instead of having, you know, the the enemy team come, it's like all these like robots and they even throw in some uh, enemy heroes that are that are AI controlled and you got to fend them off. And uh, there's two modes of this. One is you get four characters to choose from and everybody's got to be one of those four characters. I think it's a uh, and it all is like uh, it's like a flashback in time. So you get Tracer, uh, Chorborn. I forget the name of the other two. Uh, but, yeah, you get a choice of four characters. <laughs> uh, and then you basically have to just defend these sp- points for a set amount of time, then move to the next point, then move to the next point, and then you have to kind of escort a vehicle to the final destination where there's this big-ass battle uh, right at the end. And I played it on normal a few times. I played it with randoms. I didn't play it with any friends, so I wasn't communicating with anybody. And even at normal, it was difficult enough that I felt challenged. You know, I played mostly Torborn mm. with the... Yeah. With the uh, turret, I was putting down the turrets and you know trying to, you know, lock it down. And it was a lot of fun. It's it's a limited experience because it's one level. Uh, there's separate difficulties. You can play <clears throat> another mode where you can select any of the characters. Um, but it's fun. It's it's real fun. I, you know, it's not worth buying Overwatch for on its own, but it's a nice value add. And I hope they I hope they expand on it. Apparently, it's really popular too among the player population. So it's a horde mode, in effect. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay, and and I thought that the Jeff Kaplan, the the developer, had always said that don't expect PVE for Overwatch anytime well, soon. Or is this everybody's allowed to change their mind? <laughs> is this something that you think then is a nice seasonal event, which I think it is? I don't know if it's coming in permanently or if it's. Been... It is not. They've said that it's not coming in permanently. It's going to be, you know, it's here and gone. And, uh, you know, play it while it's here. And the other nice thing about it is you get a loot box for finishing it. You know, so okay. if you just go in and play it once, you get a loot box if you beat it, which is funny. You beat it, you get one loot box for each of the two modes that you can do it. Do you think, you say you wouldn't buy Overwatch for it on its own. Do you think it's something that Overwatch needs? Would it? Would Overwatch benefit from having an expanded PvE mode, you know, for endless sure. mode? Don't you think it would? I mean, those characters are so great. Wouldn't you love to have a story mode for each one of those characters? I would like it, but would it make Overwatch a better game when Overwatch is at its heart designed I as a competitive shooter? I think it would be so shooter? cool. I would want that. I really would. Yeah. I, I like it. I, I, I think it's fun to play those characters in a cooperative setting. Um, and even though it's just a, it's a fairly basic horde mode, uh, the fact that they bring the story into the game, the characters are actually talking to each other if you listen. Yeah. And like sharing some, you know, a little bit of history about the characters, which is really fun. Yeah, I think it would make it a better game. Uh, you know, they would keep the same price and add PVE to the game. Yeah, that'd be better. What about if it was continual seasonal updates, much like Destiny do with their live team? Mm-hmm. So you know, loot loot box um, focused events like this, where you get new new outfits, seasonal outfits, only limited time that you can get them. I think that's what um, they do, you- isn't it? I think there's been things like the Year of the Rooster and other things like that. I think it's the first time you've seen a, a, a proper PVE yeah, event of that nature. Time. So if you had sort of story nuggets that expanded the the Overwatch universe, spoke more about Doomfist, which I know everyone's excited to see more information on, I mean, would that be sufficient? Or do you think the game would benefit more from a, a traditional campaign or story mode? I don't know that I'd want to see a traditional like campaign like you'd see in... Uh, like I'm trying to think of a game that be you like that because because those characters if they, they'd feel a little one dimensional for a PVE or PVE like story campaign if it was just you against a world they rely yeah. on the the combination of all everybody's different talents to to kind of be a cohesive force so I I'd I'd like to see it stay as a you know uh, a team based kind of pve activity i like that i think it works for, for this game yeah and i think it's i think it's good too i just didn't know whether or not there's anyone out there that's 
you know, chomping at the bit for an Overwatch story mode. But um, I, I would play an Overwatch story mode for sure. I would love it. Yeah. I mean, those yeah. characters are just, the world they built is so fantastic. Well, Overwatch started as Project Titan, didn't it? For it was meant to be the successor to World of Warcraft. No, Titan was a separate game that was cancelled a little while ago. It was supposed to be a successor actually to World of Warcraft. Yeah, I think the assets were reused for um for Overwatch. So the, the universe and the world was actually an, an MMO world that was then stripped oh. out and a shooter engine was built on it. So oh, it, I didn't it was know that. You know, cool. it was fleshed out as an entire MMO world. So completely agree that it, it would be be great to know more. They they yeah. in my opinion they could do almost anything with that IP. Like it could go anywhere. You know? Yeah. Like they could they could give it to Marvel and start making comic books tomorrow. And it'd be a hugely popular comic book series. They could start making movies of this thing. They could start making, you know, single player campaigns uh, based off of characters from this thing. They could do anything because it's such a it's such a rich world with so many likable characters. You know, even the characters that are bad guys, you want to know more about because they feel so yeah. fleshed out. You know. Uh, next up, I was also playing a little bit of something that I'd hardly call a game, but I love it anyway. It's called Ultimate Epic Battle Simulator. It's available on Steam for 15 bucks. Oh my and god, I love the name. It is basically... It's exactly what the name says. Is You basically go into a menu and you select, okay, I would like to put a uh, 100 knights versus 1,000 zombies. And then it's you hit the start the game button and it just bashes these two forces together. It, it's $15, and I'd say maximum, it's an hour or two of fun. But it's really cool. <laughs> and I think there's going to be a lot of shit that you see on YouTube or yeah. GIFs made of this. Like you could select like uh, chickens, zombies, uh, penguins. Uh, I've tried to, World War II guys with like uh, Tommy guns. I mean, there's just, there's probably 20 or so different things you can, like types of groups you could select orcs yeah. like so many different One question yeah it's a very important question here is there the option of pope bears versus taco bells and oh that'd be so, great how many, <laughs> yeah, how many does it take great. to defeat one pope bear <laughs> but i gotta tell you it's not it's not really a game because there's no story there's no objectives it's yeah. literally it's literally you're just fucking around with a game engine and just dropping these armies in and you can drop i think up to six armies six different armies you can place them around a map and then, okay, let's just see what happens. You can also adjust, like, how much DPS each thing can do. So you can just make one ultra-powerful chicken against, you know, like, yeah. 200 zombies and see who wins. It's just, it's dumb, and it's fun. It's $15. I don't know if it's worth it to you, but it was worth it to me. Sounds magical, though. Yeah, watch oh, yeah. a couple of videos on it before you buy it, but it's it's stupid fun. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> you know, it sounds like something I'd definitely explore. I mean, I like those kind of odd, oddball experience games. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be a, a huge, sprawling open world narrative. So, yeah. So that's it. That's what I've been playing this weekend. Uh, Hollow Knight is definitely my standout as far as, like, if you haven't played Hollow Knight yet, definitely check it out. It's not on PS4, it is coming to um, the <sighs> Nintendo Switch, though. See nice. that um, DJ mentioned Yuka. I don't know if we want to touch on that before we move on. Did any of oh, you yeah, guys Yuka play, play yeah, Yuka? No, okay, no. I never liked that type of game. You weren't a Banjo fan? No, I was never a Banjo fan. And Mario was... It was good because it was so revolutionary. But it, it didn't hook me on the genre, you know? Yeah. I think from what I've seen, and I'm going to be transparent as well, I've not played it. I've, I've got a lot of other things on my plate, but I've... Spent some time watching some streams, and I've watched a lot of YouTube videos on it. Uh, I've got a friend who who has it. Was an early, actually an early backer. They had it mm -hmm. about a month ago, and they were a, a, a funder of the game. And Banjo Kazooie and Banjo Tooie were great games because they innovated the genre. As you say, they were made by Rare. There was quality throughout the collectible side of things, the little jiggies, the the pieces that you had to build your map out. Yeah, that it shit was, drives it was me nuts. It was the first time you had all that sort of stuff in the world, and the worlds were so diverse and, and rich, you know, the pirate ship world and other things like that. I think what they've done with, with Yuka and why it's got such mixed reviews is that they've captured everything that made Banjo exceptional and stand out, and they've expanded upon it, but they've not evolved it sufficiently. Yeah. So it's like playing a 2016, 2017 tech Banjo-Kazooie with more content. Um, and there's only five worlds. 
one of which being Casino World, which I've heard really poor things about. A lot of the uh, encounters are sold through mini games like slot machines and casino based games. So there's a lot of repetition there. I'd say if you're an absolute Banjo Kazooie fan, it looks like something you'd want to pick up. Me personally, it's something I'll probably wait till it's ten dollars somewhere, nice yeah. and cheap, and, and maybe mm -hmm. blitz through it then. I wonder if it's a rose tinted glasses thing too, because it's been so long since the Banjo games came out and like the Donkey Kong sixty four and Mario sixty four. Like going back to that style of game, I don't even know. Like I it was it was impressive at the time, especially Mario sixty four. But like that collectathon kind of mascot driven game, it never really appealed to my sensibilities to begin with. Mario got a pass from me because it was it was it was fun to play and it had charm, and it was something we'd never seen before. But after that, I moved away from that game style completely because I don't I don't want to go and you know look in every corner for a coin or a feather or a or a whatever. It's just not my style. Yeah, I don't know that I love those games to be honest either. Like some people do, I mean they're fun, but I just don't get super into them. Yeah, it never strokes for different folks. Exactly. Yeah, if Definitely. you love the game, hey, I've heard all good things about it. I've heard that one stage in the game in particular, the casino level, is not good at all. Like people just flat out say it's bad, which Gary is like just one said fifth that of the game. Literally, like the same words, Robbie. <laughs> Did you? I'm so sorry. I yeah, maybe maybe oh, spend okay. a little maybe time Robbie. listening, a little time less time reading the chat. <laughs> I'm sorry, and I've been reading Twitter too, so I'm That's sorry. Where, about uh, that. I think that's where Robbie heard it. You know, people people have said it. Many people have said it. Many yeah, people. tons. Okay, um, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Before we transition to the news, actually, um, Brian, I had a weird um, thing happen to me today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I know that I promised chat last week that I'd well, play. Well, if it lasts longer than four hours, you definitely want to go to the doctor. It was. I yeah. know. It's, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was blood in it. It was burning. I didn't know what to do. Um, okay, you know, get that shit out. Oh, my God. You better drive um, your ass to the hospital. Whoa. Exactly, exactly. No, just man up, man up. Um, I was playing. Man I, I, promised, I promised chat I'd play Fated, which is a Viking um, VR game for PlayStation VR, Steam, and, and Oculus. I, I said it's something I'd do. I bought the game with every intention of playing it. I thought I'd play it on PSVR because the thing's been gathering dust since I got an Oculus. I've not touched it. Uh -huh. And I wanted to experience it how chat probably would because I know there's more PSVR users. I had the game on for 10 minutes. And this isn't a particularly movement heavy game. It starts off very similar to Skyrim. You're in the back of a cart being taken to a town as a, as a Viking. And within 10 minutes of this game being on me, I was pretty violently sick. You know, right. I, I couldn't couldn't use it, couldn't do anything mm -hmm. else. And one thing that I noticed on the PlayStation VR is how blurry the resolution is. Because it really is half the resolution of what you've got in the Rift. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if my... My tolerance now for VR motion sickness is really, really high in the Rift. And I don't know, again, if it's because the frame rate and the resolution is so high. Coming back into the PSVR, I felt the um, the dynamic resolution on the periphery really heavily impact me. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the center screen was blurry. Have you played the PlayStation VR recently since moving to the Vive? I did actually go back and play some Resident Evil uh, just because I love that game so much. And I just wanted to fuck around with it again. And I went back to the scene where, no spoilers, but you're defending yourself against the chainsaw and kind of exploring around that house again. And I actually I actually went in and when I first played that, I used the 30 degree or 45 degree like snap movement. And I, th I th figured, you know, I've been playing onward. I've been playing first person shooters now. Um, so I'm going to turn on like the smooth movement. And it just like you said, instantly, boom. Yeah. It was like, oh no, this is not gonna work. Like, so I think it's a, I think it's actually a game thing. Uh, right. Some games get it right, and some games don't, and it's, it's not clear to me, the difference between those games. To be honest with you, like I have not figured it out. I don't think it's necessarily the, the resolution of the headset. I don't think it's necessarily the, uh, the frames per second because the PlayStation headset runs at ninety frames per second, like the Oculus and the, and the Vive do. So I'm not sure what it is, but I've had some games, man, they just, they set me off instantly. There's one game on PlayStation that I can't remember the name of it right now. Here it's, They Lie? Here They Lie. Thank you. It's like, yeah. I can't even, I can't even think about that game without getting sick. 
<laughs> yeah, it was just an interesting thing. I don't know if you yeah. had the same experience because I I might actually as a as a specimen or a test subject because that's available on both platforms. I might buy Fated again on um, Steam so I can yeah. have it in two places and waste money twice. <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, I, might, just... I might buy it just for science too, just to see if I have the same reaction to it. Yeah, I mean it's ten dollars on PSVR and I think it's like five dollars on Steam. Um, so it's not a hugely expensive game, and it's an hour-long experience. It's quite a nice. It looks like a Disney Pixar Viking game. Oh, really? But yeah, yeah, it's 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 cool. You you lose your voice um, and a and a what they call a siren, not siren, um, a seraphim, a Viking angel, Valkyrie. That's mm -hmm. it. Valkyrie brings you back to life, and you can only communicate with nods or or shaking your head. Um, so it's interactive in that sense. But yeah, I played. I, I didn't actually have any movement control over my character. I didn't even get that far. I was sitting in the cart on the intro to the game with only my head movement. Um, my body was static because I was laying in this cart. It made me sick. So if I can get past the cart with the Oculus, then I, I know that it's potentially a PSVR thing. Hmm. But That'd be interesting. It's fine. For $15, it's worth, it's worth figuring out, right? I mean, I'd spent $15 on something I would hardly even call the video games this weekend. So, Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Cool, but that's that's all from me. It's just I, I know I promised chat I'd play Fated, so sorry I did try. But all right, Robbie, we got some news this week. I like that silence there. That was good. Robbie, I want some news. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, let's get into it. Um, <clears throat> Star Wars Battlefront Two has been announced this week through a full reveal trailer. The game will be released on November 17th for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Battlefront 2's highly anticipated single-player campaign will be developed by Motive Studios and will take place in the 30-year period between the end of Return of the Jedi and the beginning of The Force Awakens. Cool. The story will follow an Imperial point of view as players assume the role of an elite Imperial unit known as Iden Versio. <clears throat> Multiplayer will once again be developed by DICE with assistance from Criterion Games with big new additions to multiplayer such as all three eras of Star Wars films being incorporated including planets and vehicles, full-on space battles, and more playable heroes. EA has also announced that Battlefront 2 will not have a season pass this time around. That's a lot. Alright, that is a lot of information. Did you guys see the trailer? Yeah, I did. Yeah, it looks beautiful, huh? <laughs> it's really, really good. Yeah, it, it's the same engine that you saw on Mass Effect Andromeda, so uh -huh. the Frostbite Three. So it, it's going to have environments and locales that look and feel very much like that. The only thing I'd say is I didn't play a lot of the first Battlefront. It's not the type of None game of that, that keeps me. Yeah, it's not com keeping me coming back for more. So just the fact that it looks very pretty, the first one looked great, and you could play it at 4K on PC, and it, it was actually really well scaled. You, know, you could achieve that with a decent card. I don't know that making it very pretty again and having even more Star Wars people is going to make me come back, and the fact it doesn't have a season pass whilst it's good for PR, does that mean it's not going to be supported as heavily post-launch? Yeah, that's the thing, right, is because with the first Battlefront, obviously every time we talk about that game, it, the problem is it was fun, but... And it felt like Star Wars, there's just nothing there, though. There was no content. There's no reason shallow, to play it. Right? It was, yeah. It was fun, but shallow. Whereas with this game, EA's coming out like we heard you. We're adding a single player. Hopefully, it won't be a half-assed thing. It'll be a good single player, which mm -hmm. I think it sounds pretty cool playing as the Empire. I think yeah, that could be cool. Yeah, the setup sounds good, right? Yeah, and then the fact that, you know, the multiplayer is going to have all three eras of the Star Wars films. There's going to be Rey, Kylo Ren. You can play as Yoda, Darth Maul. Like, there's tons of characters. Full-on space battles is exciting to me. That would be really cool. Uh, just the fact that they're saying this is going to be a full experience. I think they've probably learned their lesson. And also the thing is, too, with the first Battlefront, it was a full-price game. It didn't feel complete. And then on top of that, you had a season pass to pay for, which definitely people were very sour about. So this is like, we're going to give you way more content at launch, and then we're not going to make you buy all this stuff, which I think sounds awesome. But... Who knows, man? I mean, we'll have to wait and see. I'm yeah, waiting for E3 for them right, to sell Robbie. me. We do have to wait and see, but I mean, I, I do believe that EA is probably putting a little more weight behind this. And if they, you know, if they've been de developing this since they released the first one, you know, hopefully they've had enough time to add some content to this game because 
In, in my mind, that's all the first game needed. I, the, the game was fun, right? It was yeah. super Great fun. Great groundwork. But it was just super shallow. Like, there just wasn't a whole lot, you know, to explore and to keep you coming back. Uh, so yeah. if they can if they can add that single player in, plus they can add a little more depth to the multiplayer. I mean, they got an easy winner on their hands because, you know, I've never played a game that made me look feel like I was in a Star Wars movie before. Like, oh yeah, did. they it nailed that part. Fucking of it. unbelievable! Uh, it just, you know, there just wasn't enough to do. So I'm looking forward to this. Basically, well, like thing people that... have said, it's like a blueprint for something better to come. That's perfect yeah, for a first right. Battlefront. Yeah. Right. I mean, what what makes me nervous is the fact that it's one elite imperial guy um i feel like battlefield one really nailed the single player for those sorts of games you know made by the same guys using the same engine it wouldn't it have been great to have rather than one campaign that potentially is half assed it might be an eight hour campaign at best you had eight one hour campaigns with all different soldiers and different perspectives of the conflicts from different yeah. time well, on that, that point gary changed. also another thing to mention is that there are moments where you'll play as uh, luke skywalker and kylo ren like there will be you'll okay. actually play in as the multiplayer the, uh, or well. in the single player game no because also the make, single player that doesn't make any sense how can you play as kylo ren would you say 20 years before it's it during be a baby <laughs> Well, it's no, but it's going to take place <laughs> over thirty years, so it'll skip forward. That's probably it. Like you know, oh, okay. R roll around as a kid, Kylo Ren shaking a rattle, and that would be adorable. <laughs> don't know how fun it would be though. No, I mean I don't know. Re I'll, I'm going to reserve rights to judge, but I, I, yeah. I kind of hold everything to Battlefield One standards now in terms of single player yeah. campaign. And this sounds me. awesome. And the thing that makes me a little more excited for Battlefront Two is the fact that for a company to, to truly want to change what they're doing. I think with the first Battlefront, we know it sold okay. It didn't sell as well as they wanted to. I know that. It underperformed. I think that's the main reason why they're probably like, okay, we really need to put some effort into this game. We need a campaign. We need a substantial game. I think they're going to do it just because they know Battlefront 1 didn't do what they wanted it to do. So that makes me more confident. I mean, I'm just going to wait till E3 for them to sell it to me and see how complete it really is. Yeah, It's all about E3, really. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I might I might actually wait for the reviews to come out. But I mean, even if it's, you know, if, if I hear that the campaign is, you know, a decent campaign, I'll probably buy it just because I'm such a Star Wars fan, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And how long will that campaign even be? I mean, it's probably going to be something like six hours, I would have to imagine. I mean, how can you say it's probably going to be six hours when you have no idea? Right. <laughs> That's what, true. What basis do you have for it's probably going to be six hours? I'm just, no, it's just a wild guess. Really, I just I'm, have that feeling. I'm going to be the be man sick. who once more in the podcast says, length is not important. It's the quality. <laughs> lies, lies, lies. Look at time. You need some length, though, <laughs> to be fair. You need to be able to stick that thing in and, you know, have them feel it. But anyways. <laughs> the, the, the art to it, Robbie, is to never actually refer directly do the sex or the dick, right? <laughs> is you just want to you want to play around the periphery, right? You don't want to get right to right. the point. That's it's the 100%. key. That's yes. the key. Feet, feet around the bush. Yes. Feet around the bush. Exactly. All right. What's next up for news? After numerous supply issues, Nintendo has officially stopped production of the NES Classic Edition worldwide. What the fuck? Me yeah. Basically, <laughs> what the fuck? They are shipping out another shipment, right? You one last shipment, yeah. One I last think. shipment. It better be a big one because I really wanted one of these things. Me too. I really want one now with this news. Like, yeah. <sighs> like, Gary, yeah, what do you think? I've, I've heard different things on this one, so I, I think it's not as uh, it's easy to meme and go. You know, Nintendo. We've got a great you know selling thing that's that's sold out everywhere. Quick, let's can it. Yeah, it's easy to meme them in that way, but. I've heard lots of different takes on it and people that have spoken about things going on behind the scene with game licensing. So you've got 30 games on there that potentially they, they need licensing for to, to put out as free packing content or packing software. The fact that you're giving them away for $50, one, you're, you're I guess, reducing potential sales on the eShop. And then secondly, you've got to manage the publishers and the original IP owners. Even if one of them there wanted to renegotiate their contract and play hardball, Nintendo probably... Do you think this really does? Does it compete directly with the eShop? Or is this selling? I mean, I'm sure at some level, to some consumers, it does. But a lot of people who don't even play video games are going out and grabbing these things. 
Yeah, right? I don't they, feel like it. They played does. games back in the you know back when the NES was a relevant thing when they were kids, and now mm-hmm. you know they're they're married with families. They haven't played a video game in you know fifteen years, and the NES Classic. Oh, I remember playing this game. That'd be fun to have around. It's only fifty bucks. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, I see your point. I mean, it's just when you're managing that many potential IPs and potential contracts with software distributors or software owners. If even one of them throws a spanner in the works, you've got to can the whole thing. They can't strip out one software title. And also the fact it got jailbroken, it got hacked. Mm. Nintendo, I think that the, might have something to do with it. Yeah. I mean, to, whether they're going to cut their own nose off to spite their face, the fact is they're not going to put out there a platform that allows people to very easily jailbreak and hack and have a perfect emulator, really, for ROMs. What if this is part one of a very long-term plan? What if next holiday season, you know, they cancel this one, right? And everybody's, like, mm-hmm. disappointed because they weren't able to get one. And next holiday season, they announce another one with another a different 30 games. And, you know, they do that for a few years in a row. Or they they announce a SNES version of it with yeah. with some games on it. Like, what if they decide to make this, like... You know, like a holiday season type of thing that's only available for a limited time. You know, and if you see one, you definitely want to pick it up. And it just kind of, you know, becomes almost like a collector's item. Like, like uh, you know, c- certain Amiibos that are very rare. Yeah. yeah, I think the problem, I think why people are so upset that the NES Classic is being canceled is because it seemed like it would be a long-term thing. And then people are like, what the hell? Why are they stopping production? Maybe you're right. Maybe it was meant to be a collector's kind of thing all along, but they... Maybe People they're just stopping production they... to, to retool for the next version. Yeah, who knows? I think I think you struck something there with the Amiibo side of things. So potentially it's, there's such a razor-thin line between understocking and overstocking this unit. It's not something that's going to have mass consumer demand. It's a niche product. And the Amiibos, I remember they were like gold dust to get hold of them, like any Amiibo, empty. You know, you had to be camped outside. You had to sell your children you know, jerk off strangers in the street just to get an amiibo. Like Whoa. nowadays, that sounds like a beastly it, kind of thing to do. Well, it's exactly that. Nowadays, there's amiibos stocked everywhere. Maybe one or two of them that that were underproduced aren't there, but they're in the shelves. So potentially, Nintendo could be taking a view that they don't want to be holding stock on something that they're going to have to really heavily discount to sell uh, when they when they need to be focusing on Switch production or potential models or variants. So as you say, it, it could just be a fact that they could kill it now and know that they've they've definitely got a demand for the remaining units. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't know. We, we're not Nintendo, so yeah, it's an it's like interesting decision no matter what. And I I'm I'm definitely disappointed I didn't get one. And I think I'm actually more disappointed I didn't get one now that I know that I probably won't be getting one. Yeah, because if right? I did get one now, I don't even think I'd open that box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I'd just, yeah, sell it with knowing how valuable they're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're seeing the uh, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars on, on eBay. How realistic that is, I don't know. But I think it's just going to go up. I think over time it'll be even more. I, 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 don't, don't, maybe. I don't see it going up. I, I think, oh, at, that, I think so. at that point there, if you're a collector, you, you probably want a real NES in mint, but I don't know. Hmm. Maybe. <sighs> Yeah, who knows? All right, next bit of news. Namco Bandai is teasing a brand new game with a very Dark Souls type of tagline, Prepare to Dine. Have you guys seen the trailer for this? I'm. <laughs> dine, yeah, like obvious yeah. Dark Souls reference. Yeah. So the trailer sort of reminds me of Bloodborne in a way, but it's a very interesting style. Have you seen it, Gary? Like the art style? It's very different. I have, looking. yeah. It's, it's almost like um, it's got that... A kind of stylized edge to it, more artsy, more it's it's less um, gothic than you saw with with Dark Souls. So yeah, that's why I was thinking more along the lines of Bloodborne. And I'm wondering if this is even a from software project. Like, is this their next spiritual successor, kind of, or who the heck knows? But we'll find out on April 20th. That's when the reveal of it is. So it's soon. I mean, I'm excited. So it didn't have from software in the there anywhere. No, we don't know. It could be, but we don't know. It it actually looked more like a, a Persona game. It's got that very monochromatic kind of look about it, uh, from my perspective as well, the kind of uh, Japanese-style shadow ghosts with the, the big grinning face. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was an interesting take. 
they're, they're Japanese companies, so they could be taking more of a, an Eastern slant on the dark side. They could be doing some weird thing. Who knows? They're 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 weird. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the, the fact that it's it looks like animals that are sort of dripping blood out their mouth. It could be like soul eaters and then that kind of side of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. I'm not a Dark Souls fan, but that style of art and that style of game oh, presentation. Gary, I love am. Dark Souls. Oh, man. If you could put on God mode and never never die, no matter how many times you hit, I'd play through it and, and enjoy it. But I, 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 I played the Dark Souls 2, is it? Um, and I got mm-hmm. to the part where there's a dragon asleep on uh, a load of... Uh, in, in a castle, there was like a, a load of rock men trying to kill me. I mean, it was, oh, it was I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. 15 minutes into the game, and I got killed so many times, I turned it <laughs> off and never played it again. <laughs> that was it. That's that's people's most experience with Dark Souls. I don't Souls. have like, a whole lot of like drive to play Dark Souls either, but part of it is the aesthetic doesn't really appeal to me that much. Like a lot of people love the aesthetic of Dark Souls and love the world, but Bloodborne, even though it has similar gameplay, the fact that it was a little faster paced than the uh, the aesthetic in the world was so novel. Like you, I've just never seen a game set in that kind of uh, in that kind of a world before. It was. It, I ended up liking uh, Bloodborne so much that I did end up giving Dark Souls three a shot. I still didn't really like. It. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I'm still with my thing. All right, <clears throat> I play Bloodborne news. too, though. Oh my god, I would too, absolutely. All right, next bit of news. Xbox Project Scorpio will finally have a full reveal at this year's E3, confirms Phil Spencer. So I'm sure we all thought this was going to happen. This isn't another, you know, sort of tech leak thing. This is like the full reveal, name, price, date, I'm sure are all 100% going to happen. But yeah, it's time. an important moment for Microsoft. They're going to unveil the price of that thing, which is E That's to its success. Huge. But they're That's also going to have to show us a reason to buy it like great yeah. it's it's powerful awesome but who cares if there's no software that's exactly so it's you know nobody wants to have a muscle car sitting in the garage everyone wants to, want to go out and drive it right yeah but that's for multi-platform games i mean it doesn't have the exclusives granted sony's got that nailed down but sony's got that because they've got competitor advantage at the moment they are the, the market shareholder and that's what they've got mm-hmm. right for multi-plats you're going to start seeing people buying it on xbox again surely if if you know that categorically well, this looks best on Xbox, Gary, they don't they always. They, what I often see is that the the more powerful console doesn't necessarily get the best looking port of a game because the games are normally developed for the most the most popular console, which is going to be the PS4. So, yeah, like we've seen we've seen the most powerful console get shitty ports, you know, throughout the history of games. You know, the Xbox was more powerful than the PS2, but got you know. And they both got the same games, but the Xbox version was awful, often worse. The Xbox yeah. 360, the PS3 version of a lot of games, was often often worse. Mm-hmm. Would, you know, just because it's got more power doesn't mean the games are going to look better for multiplats. Right. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I, I just feel like Xbox are doing so much work around their infrastructure, which to an extent is catch up and damage mitigation from the launch of the mm-hmm. Xbox One. But the work around our next news article, which I'm going to obviously leave until we go into that, but that that's a great step into building consumer confidence but but also the chat app the fact it's integrated with windows and people that are using their pcs have a, a, a single singular chat app mm-hmm. the, the fact that they've really worked on the dashboard to improve the overall experience there the re- complete removal of connect and the move away from being a, a one-stop media shop to back to a core games console i wouldn't count xbox out i, I feel like xbox are now blending the generations and saying don't wait for xbox 2 developers start coming back and having confidence with us and 18 months time you know next e3 effectively e3 2018 Mm -hmm. xbox is going to have some real quality exclusives to announce maybe some to release that year things that are going to make you want to come back and play xbox again so you you can't expect scorpio to come out and suddenly you're going to have horizon quality exclusives on xbox i I just don't think we're going to see that sort of time space turnaround but yeah that's the thing too people are expecting scorpio like microsoft to just pull these exclusives out of nowhere and i'm like maybe but first of all you got to look at their first parties like we know what most of them are doing you know obviously we know there's going to be a halo 6 we know there's crackdown and uh scale or not scale bound anymore uh sea of thieves um yeah you're up scale bound but yeah like you know maybe they could do sort of third party exclusive deals like i'm sure there will be maybe some of those coming but again it's like don't 
don't expect them to just pull these exclusives out of nowhere unless they really make some deals. Just, you know, kind of wait and see on that. So I wouldn't mm. put your anticipation up too high. All right, I don't know about your thoughts on it as well. I know you've got the Windows Store there, which uh, Microsoft are obviously going to want to promote. What's the chances or the likelihood ever that you see Steam to, uh, from some variant at least come into Xbox? No way. Steam Store. No, they'd never no? let that happen. You don't think? No. Why? Because that would require Microsoft to share its profits with a third party. No, I don't see any reason to do it. Do they not already do that? With who? With Steam on the PC platform. They so don't have a choice, though. Steam. On, on the, on the PC is an open platform. Anybody can you know, write software and open a store up on the PC and start selling yeah. PC software. The Xbox is a closed platform. Like Steam can't just write an app and have it appear on the Xbox One. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just thinking about how desirable it would make it if you had this huge plethora of... Suddenly you worry about game drought. You don't really have that with Steam. As long as you've got Steam developers working for the Xbox platform, then you, know, you can start feeding content through there. It's just a thought. The okay. Xbox 360 had something like that. I struggle to see what it... remember what it was called, but basically they, they really encouraged... Um, indie developers to uh, release games on the Xbox 360 and they even had this like special marketplace just for indies that you know you could go there hmm. and you, there's a lot of shit in there but there's some real gems in there. Summer too. of Arcade is that what you're thinking of? No no uh, it was more obscure than that oh I'm not too sure then hmm. yeah I'd have to look it up it, it was it was very much like a indie development thing and it worked a lot like Greenlight does or did um, where you had like a community that was voted You're, to I'm thinking the ID at Xbox but that's Xbox One they introduced that so it can't be that the, the thing with Xbox is it needs it needs the grassroots games to come from somewhere and Sony is advantageous that they've got the Asian background to have a lot of quality Japanese games that get ported over and a lot of Japanese developers that work for them Japan don't give a shit about Xbox and Japan don't give a shit about Microsoft if we're completely honest. The thing no, you're say. right. Yeah. Um, so the games have to be homegrown. They have to be European development houses, American development houses. I'm just, you know, trying to spitball. If I was sitting in Phil Spencer's shoes, wh where would I be sourcing my games from? That said, though, look at Scalebound. That was a Japanese developed game. Although I would say that's a very North American kind of game. I can see people here getting excited for that. Mm. So... I mean, they they do need to be looking at getting Microsoft Game Studios kind of rolling again and getting some some companies under that umbrella again. They, they really that. decimated that at the end of the 360s life cycle uh, to the point where you know there's not there's just not a whole lot of exclusive games coming out for Xbox, and that's to the real detriment of the Xbox brand. Yeah, you can count them on one hand pretty much. Like there's just not many. Whereas Sony is has a huge lineup of exclusives right now, and they all look fantastic. Like they, they're killing it right now when it comes to exclusives. And Microsoft's got a tough battle. They really do with that. Yeah, we're Microsoft fans. 